Bonjour, Habari Zamchana. Hello, and Eid Mubarak. My name is Paul Curry. I'm a senior professional officer with Ik Africa, and it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to our final webinar for the African City Food Month um, sessions. Bienvenue à tous. Merci de votre participation. Pour écouter notre webinar en français, veuillez cliquer en bas de votre écran sur l'onglet Interpretation et sélectionnez le drapeau français. Merci. Before we begin, um, I'd just like to remind you of our webinar protocols. We are recording this webinar, so uh, by participating, you are consenting uh, to be recorded. Uh, we would like to invite you to introduce yourself in the chat um, and to add any questions and ideas uh, as we uh, continue throughout uh, our webinar. Um, we have a really wonderful uh, group of speakers to provide some provocations, um, and we trust that it will be an enjoyable uh, webinar. Given that this is our final webinar, we decided on the theme of our future food systems. Uh, and to that end, we would like to introduce the webinar with a video that we made as part of the Cape Town Food System Vision, um, as part of Rockefeller Foundation's call for future visions. And we've adapted this um, to be a provocation for uh, many cities. Imagine a city where residents no longer worry about where their next meal will come from, where the food system responds to their needs. This is a just food system. Imagine a city that is locally reliant for fresh produce and food. Imagine a city that is resilient to shocks and stresses to its food systems. Imagine a city that champions solidarity, where COVID has left its scars, but also learnings. Imagine a city that boasts the healthiest people, with safe food and no person or family ever going hungry. Imagine a city that disowns the concept of waste, using everything. Imagine a city that leads the world with novel bio-based and biodegradable food packaging. Imagine a city that is awarded for its circular economy dining experiences. Imagine a city that enjoys a vibrant economy based on local food cultures. Imagine a city that is socially cohesive through shared food experiences. Imagine a city that is climate neutral. Imagine a city that promotes agency, opportunity, and inclusivity for all its citizens. Imagine a city that welcomes international scholars to learn and exchange knowledge about its food systems innovations. Imagine a city that is open and transparent with its data, creativity, and innovation. Imagine a city that is governed with foresight, trust, and participation in a pluralistic manner. Add your voice to the future of African urban food systems. Join us for African City Food Month. So that was one of our uh, entries for the Food System uh, Vision Prize. Uh, and we have another uh, participant in that who's going to share uh, their process a bit later. Uh, but as is tradition uh, with the beginning of our webinars, let's see who's joining us. So uh, when asking for your favorite foods, rice has been a clear winner this month, vegetables, fruit, beans, curry, mango, bananas, chicken, guava, Cameroonian foods, stews, pounded foods, yam, uh, ice cream, pasta from all over. And from our cities, today we're represented uh, quite well by Cape Town, Johannesburg, Los Angeles, Hyderabad, Nairobi, Antananarivo, Dhaka, Gombe, Montpellier, Ouagadougou, Durban, Niamey, Accra, Sao Paulo, um, and Rome with our colleagues in FAO. So uh, today uh, we're very, um, uh, before we get to uh, our prize guest, um, African City Food Month uh, is brought to you by ICLI, um, 
FAO and RUAF with the support uh, of our partners, the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact, Ricolto, African Center for Cities, WWF, the South African Food and Farming Trust, and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And um, we would not have been able to uh, have such a program without their support. And uh, we look forward uh, to taking the food work uh, forward in many ways with these partners. I'd now like to introduce Kobe Brandt, who's the Regional Director of Italy Africa, to welcome us uh, and open this webinar. So Kobe, uh, you can uh, join us with your video. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. And um, also a very warm welcome on behalf of Italy Africa to all our partners, to all our cities, to our dignitaries, our mayors, our governors um, and now colleagues, participants from all over the world. It's a real pleasure for me to be opening this last uh, webinar, the sixth webinar um, of this month. And what a month it has been. African City Food Month. We can only go from strength to strength. Just a little bit of statistics, um, just for the first five webinars, not counting today. We've had already over 520 unique participants over these last weeks, this month, um, from over 210 different cities and 370 different organizations around the continent and from around the world. So we've, been, we've had wonderful resources, wonderful presentations, great insights, deep debates, hard questions, provocative uh, uh, and stimulating visual and other technologies used. Um, what a month it has been. And I can only say I'm so proud of what Ikli Africa, our colleagues Ruav, FAO and all the others have achieved together to raise the voice of African cities when it comes to food. So what, uh, what we focused on, and I don't want to take up a lot of time because we want to hear from a fantastic roundup of speakers today on today's topic, but what we've heard uh, in previous webinars, we focused on food in our cities and the emphasis there was that Food should be looked at in a systemic way. Systems approaches highlight the opportunities locked inside our cities. And then we also have resilient food systems, uh, which we focus on making the case that they can, that food is a vital component of um, addressing pandemics and other um, uh, issues like climate change. Nourishing our cities, the focus is on malnutrition. We cannot tackle food security without addressing malnutrition. And sustainable food chains was another focus we had, making sure that those connections to biodiversity, health, nature and well-being are all made and uh, focusing on the interconnectedness of all these different topics and promoting circularity in when we're talking about food and then our last one just just a, a few days ago this week was our focusing on women youth and business and innovation equity and inclusion of women and youth is integral to addressing more secure food systems in the continent and that was highlighted so very aptly in that last webinar so with these words i want to hand back and i'm looking forward to today and thank you very much for joining us today thank you very much paul for the opportunity to be here with you thanks kobe for welcoming us in um and for giving us the overview of the themes that we've uh, done this um, month. So uh, our program for today on our next slide is to look into the future, reflecting from what we've discussed, um, but then to summarize uh, a bit more clearly um, what uh, we aim for uh, as we move forward with our um, food systems. So uh, our first speaker uh, who uh, we put first um, because the Eid celebrations are um, cutting into uh, some of the time today um, is Mayor from the city of Niami, uh, who's going to share uh, some insights on the work done in Niami to improve uh, understanding of uh, food systems. Um, we'll then move to a program where uh, we try to contextualize food systems uh, from a wider perspective uh, with our first input by Lewis Hove of the FAO um, Sub-Regional Office for Southern Africa. I apologize for leaving your designation off here. Um, and then Jane Battersby Leonard from the African Center for Cities to speak about uh, what cities can do um, to properly improve their food systems moving forward. We hope to be joined by uh, Mayor Aji Sowa from the Accra Metropolitan Assembly. Um, I understand the Eid celebrations are also 
um, calling for his time, uh, so I hope he can join us. Um, uh, Elizabeth uh, Kimani Muraja will then give reflections on uh, her vision for Nairobi and the work done uh, to consolidate this vision. Um, before uh, we come step back out, uh, where Kodani uh, Muladzi, who's the chair of the Resilient 40 uh, Climate Activist Network um, and the research and project coordinator for WWF South Africa, will um, contextualize food in reference to a just transition. Um, from there, we'll step out again to uh, Vice Mayor Anna Skavutso, who will reflect um, on uh, policy and governance when it comes uh, to our food systems uh, and the work that's being done by the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact. Uh, before we return home uh, to some of Ickley's perspectives shared by Ryan Fisher, um, who will reflect on uh, native climate uh, and equity um, and the food system. Uh, we'll then have a period of discussion, so we really hope you will uh, throw questions into the chat and into the Q&A as speakers are um, giving their inputs. Um, and finally, we'll close uh, the webinar and indeed the month with words from Patrice Tala, the FAO sub-regional coordinator uh, for Southern Africa, as well as the FAO representative for Zimbabwe and Eswatini. Um, Kobe Brunt will then close us off with a word of thanks um, and uh, see where we can look to in the future. So uh, without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Mayor Mamadou uh, to turn on his video and microphone um, and share uh, in five minutes uh, some of the key work being done uh, in Niamey. Great. Merci, bonjour à tous. Je vous remercie donc de cette occasion que vous m'offrez pour parler de la ville de Niamey et de ce que nous sommes en train de faire dans le domaine de l'alimentation, dans le domaine de l'agriculture urbaine. Ce qu'il faut dire, la ville de Niamey, comme la plupart des villes africaines, est soumise à un phénomène d'une croissance démographique forte et d'un étalement urbain très fort. Et cette croissance de la population et de l'étalement urbain s'effectue dans une dynamique déséquilibrée parce que la ville, c'est un cocktail, c'est un ensemble de plusieurs dynamiques pour lesquels il faut trouver des équilibres. Et je disais tantôt qu'il y a un étalement urbain. La ville de Niamey est entourée par des communes rurales, par des terres agricoles. Malheureusement, qui se retrouvent aujourd'hui à la merci de cette urbanisation. Donc, face à ce constat, l'idée pour nous, c'est de créer des nouveaux centres d'intérêt, des nouvelles dynamiques pour freiner cette, cet étalement urbain et freiner de la capitale. Pourquoi il faut freiner l'étalement urbain Parce que tout simplement, cela demande beaucoup de moyens en termes de services urbains. Mais surtout cela en train de faire disparaître les terres agricoles. Donc nous avons fait une petite analyse pour trouver un peu les dynamiques existantes sur ces terrains. Et nous avons trouvé exactement que nous avons des groupements de jeunes, de femmes, des populations qui font de l'agriculture sur les terrains, malheureusement, qui ne sont pas suffisamment soutenus pour faire face à ce phénomène d'urbanisation. Et nous avons identifié sur ces terrains qui sont autour de la ville de Niamey ou bien à l'intérieur de la ville de Niamey pour payer... Can I inter interrupt uh, briefly? We um, are not able to have uh, your translation, so we're missing out. Um, Jess, uh, is there something we can address from your side? Uh, can you repeat? Okay. Sorry, I didn't understand. Um, Monsieur Le Maire, may I ask oh, you to, yeah. to continue? Um, we now should have... Je vais reprendre. Il y a pas de souci. Je peux reprendre? Yes, please. Merci beaucoup. 
Alors, je salue tout le monde. Je vous remercie de cette opportunité que vous offrez à la ville de Niamey pour partager son expérience avec plusieurs pays du monde. Aujourd'hui, les villes africaines, y compris la ville de, de Niamey, ne fait pas exception, sont soumises à des phénomènes d'urbanisation très forts d'urbanisation centrée sur une démographie importante et aussi un étalement urbain fort. Cet étalement urbain pétine sur les terres agricoles. On est face à des villes qui, sont, qui se développent, qui se construisent au détriment des terres agricoles. Et constat fait, nous voulons changer de paradigme, nous voulons changer de façon de faire, de façon de fonctionnement de notre ville pour faire de la ville de Niamey une ville durable, une ville soutenable. La ville soutenable, la ville durable, c'est celle qui va trouver un équilibre entre les différentes dynamiques, les dynamiques qui correspondent aux besoins de ces populations. Or, dans un territoire vivant, les populations ont besoin de quoi se nourrir. Et la ville soutenable, c'est celle qui peut nourrir ces populations elles-mêmes. Or, la ville de Niamey, telle que les choses s'effectuent les dernières années, on risque d'être en face ou bien d'avoir une ville qui n'arrive pas à s'autosuffire. Et ce qui fait que nous avons identifié sur le territoire de la ville de Niamey des dynamiques allant dans le sens de la promotion de l'agriculture urbaine. Nous avons identifié que ce soit à l'intérieur de la ville ou sur la périphérie, toutes, toutes les organisations, les personnes, c'est en général des, des femmes, euh, des jeunes ou bien des maraîchers qui travaillent et qui vivent de ça, mais malheureusement, qui se trouvent dans des difficultés face à cette expansion démographique qui consomme de l'espace, mais de l'espace pour l'habitat. Alors, pour renverser la tendance, nous avons fait le choix de soutenir tous ces groupements toutes ces organisations pour qu'ils fassent de la production sur le terrain, qu'ils trouvent un centre d'intérêt à développer de l'agriculture et à écouler leurs produits. Alors, nous avons recensé, une, actuellement, nous accompagnons plus de 30 organisations pour lesquelles nous avons... Donc, ils ont besoin d'eau, ils ont besoin de semences, ils ont besoin de matériel de fonctionnement. Ce n'est pas tout à fait grand-chose, mais quand on a vu le résultat avec peu de moyens, nous avons pu amener ces organisations de jeunes, ces organisations de femmes à développer de l'agriculture, à s'autosuffire et mieux à écouler ces produits donc dans les, 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 le centre urbain ou les différents centres urbains. Pour certains, nous avons fait des, des, des marchés donc de, de légumes pour qu'ils écoulent leurs produits. Nous organisons des événements pour faire des foires où ces femmes, ces jeunes viennent exposer et vendre leurs produits pour leur permettre de couler ça rapidement. L'intérêt de ces appuis, ça permet, ça permet à ces populations de prendre conscience que la valeur de la terre, ce n'est pas seulement quand on construit là-dessus. La valeur de la terre, c'est surtout lorsqu'on fait de l'agriculture. Quand on construit, on construit une seule fois, alors que quand on fait de l'agriculture sur une terre, on la fait de manière vraiment durable et, 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 et pérenne. L'autre aspect, ça nous permet, nous, au fur et à mesure, de mettre en place un mécanisme de la sécurisation foncière et de la caractérisation ou de la typologie de l'occupation du sol. Il y a à Niamey des terres qui sont aptes à la construction, cela, nous pouvons les dédier à la construction, mais nous avons aussi des terres qui ne sont pas aptes à la construction, beaucoup plus aptes à l'agriculture urbaine. C'est par exemple, si vous connaissez un peu Niamey, Niamey, est divisé en deux par le fleuve Niger. Donc, tout autour du fleuve Niger, nous avons des terres qui sont propices. Mais aussi, le, ce fleuve a des affluents. Donc, autour de ces affluents. Aujourd'hui, moi, en tant que responsable de la ville, ça me permet aussi de régler la question des inondations, décourager les populations à ne pas construire sur les terres inondables, mais aussi encourager les populations à faire de l'agriculture sur les terres euh, inondables. Donc, on est un peu dans cette démarche 
d'une construction urbaine qui intègre et qui donne place à l'agriculture urbaine comme étant un élément structurant, une composante indispensable à la, à la, à la vie urbaine. Donc voilà un peu la, la démarche de la, la, la ville de Niamey, qui est celle d'une urbanisation durable, une urbanisation soutenable, qui donne place à tout les composantes de cette réalité urbaine. La réalité urbaine, c'est l'homme. La réalité urbaine, c'est l'environnement. La réalité urbaine, c'est l'eau. La réalité urbaine, c'est tout ce qu'il peut avoir comme dynamique. Et dans cette dynamique, il ne faut pas du tout que l'agriculture soit marginalisée. Nous essayons autant que possible de donner une place, donner la place de l'agriculture urbaine telle qu'elle le mérite par rapport à la configuration sociale, par rapport à la démographie. Il y a même 1,5 million d'habitants. C'est 1,5 million d'habitants qui doivent avoir une terre qui peut les suivre, qui peut les alimenter. Voilà un peu, j'ai été un peu long. Hein. Merci. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think that's a really great insight um, of what we've been arguing is not to have food as an afterthought. Um, but to have it as a central way that we can do sustainable um, urbanization. Thank you so much for your inputs. We hope you will uh, be able to stay as long as possible. Um, and uh, we hope you will join yeah, us merci. in the campaign going forward. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Lewis to uh, reflect on building resilient uh, food futures in our cities. Uh, Lewis, if you can start your video. There we go. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. Uh, good afternoon, good morning. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'll probably start by going back to the second webinar during the campaign, where we discussed the challenges of the COVID and what we have learned from it. It was clear that the current ordeal of the COVID crisis is an opportunity to reestablish and improve the resilience of our food systems. And many cities, and food system stakeholders are doing that already. The effects of the crisis force us to reflect on where, how, and by whom the food we consume is produced, processed, transported, and sold. And I think for the first time, these questions have been raised by almost everyone in Africa, whether you're poor, whether you're rich, whether you're living in the urban setting or in the rural areas. But what we also see is that increasingly the urban consumers seem to care more about the food they eat as they are the final segment in the food value and supply chains and thus affected severely by the effects of the pandemic. But also other cities in the food systems, including droughts, pests and diseases, we know this Southern Africa region, most parts of Africa, of Africa Drought is a major problem. Pests and diseases, we've got the, the locusts that are ravaging East Africa, the desert locusts, we've got the migratory locusts in Southern Africa that are also in some countries in Southern Africa. All these are shocks that are disrupting the production. And for the first time, the consumers in the urban settings are talking about all these disruptions that normally are a preserve for the rural. We also know that the emergence and, and control measures for all these disruptions have also been affected by the COVID movement restrictions. I would like to just share with the participants that FAO, under the work of the urban food agenda, is constantly searching to understand new and more insights into the, into the drivers and factors that affect the food systems in African cities. We've just concluded a survey in 2020, where we are looking at uh, the, assessing the impacts of COVID on the food systems in cities worldwide. And Africa participation was very good in this survey. And this study has provided concrete policy and action options that can be considered by all stakeholders and it's available on the FAO website. We'll make sure that we, it is shared and for everyone to be able to, to, to see some of those actions and probably see if they are relevant for your own situation. But what this crisis, the pandemic, 
has made us think, made us uh, see how we can improve. But how can we learn from that and craft more resilient food systems going forward? What is very clear is that we need to see governance mechanisms in place at the local level. We need to see support to local and small and medium businesses. We need to see incentives for the consumers to procure local food. And how do you do that? I think we have to understand that any change we are going to see in our Af African urban food systems, we rely strongly on capacity for, for coordination and deliver of the food to the most needed and on a capacity to produce better, more local and more nutritious food. Cities are in a good position to identify the most vulnerable people and their needs, but also to build institutions policies and mechanisms for financing and supporting the leadership of private sector to make this change. Private sector participation is critical for sustainability. During the crisis, the, the COVID crisis, cities also facilitated meetings between local food offers, the retailers and the consumers. As previous existing disruptions Distribution, existing distribution systems were disrupted with the closure of school canteens, restaurants, and open markets. These included innovative solutions provided by the informal sectors, actors in terms of transportation, where motorbikes and wheelbarrows were used in, in a very innovative ways to get the food across. And ICT, information communication technologies, digital tools on smartphones, to link low income consumers, local producers. These are some of the examples of the innovations that took place during the crisis. We also heard on Wednesday this week from two incredible women business innovators from Africa, Mali and Uganda to be specific. These two young women are leading the change we want to see in the food systems. Both are investing in locally processed foods both are bothered by the current state of our huge import and foreign foods on the shelves of the markets. I would recommend that we all listen to that uh, video from the, from the ladies in, uh, from Mali and Uganda, because their determination to place local food that's affordable, nutritious, and of high standards onto our shelves is very impressive. Let me talk, also talk a bit about the role of consumers as a driver of change to, to the future more resilient, nutritious food systems. Cities and governments need to incentivize consumers to procure and consume, consume more local food. Without the consumers demanding local produced food, we won't win our war the war to get more resilient food systems, the war to get urban dwellers eating nutritious food that is locally produced. Let me go back to the point of coordination. Overall, local government had, had to work closely with the private sector during the pandemic in searching appropriate solutions. It has become clear that this crisis has demonstrated the complexity of food systems health, agriculture, food processing, education, transport, social action, economy, all had a role to play. More than ever, the need for interlinkages between the sectors have been highlighted. We need to see that this is strengthened. City leaders should now more than ever invest in cross-sectoral approaches and pub public-private dialogue and foster that aspect in both their strategic and day-to-day -day work. The cross-sectoral aspects of the informal sector, for example, have to be entirely considered as part of the food system. So we have to, in summary, I'll just summarize, Paul, to say that the, the, the pandemic has made us realize that we, we, we have an opportunity. And let's not miss this opportunity to reestablish and improve the resilience of our food systems. But we need to strengthen the governance of the food systems in the cities to, be, to ensure that we are localizing our production. We've also learned that there are many cities that are doing a lot of good things and there's need to share those experiences 
right across the globe. And FAO is ready to help in that. And a multi-stakeholder and multi-sectoral approach is necessary if we are going to achieve the transformation to more resilient food systems. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lewis, for, for your points. And uh, I really appreciate how you've referenced some of the uh, ideas coming out of the previous uh, sessions. Um, thanks very much for the inputs. Can I ask all uh, attendees uh, to please um, note uh, any questions into the chat or into the Q&A, uh, as we would uh, like to have some good time for discussion later on. Uh, it's my pleasure to now introduce uh, Jane Battersby Leonard uh, from the African Center for Cities, uh, who's going to give us a few provocations um, for doing food in a different way into the future. Thanks so much, Jane, for joining us. Okay, thank you, Paul, and thanks um, everybody for being here. Uh, Ryan, can you start the presentation, please? Great. So, um, mindful of the fact that I've only got five minutes, I've got three points. Really thinking about how how we can move urban food governance in African cities forwards. So um, Ryan, the next slide, please. So the first point, I think, is that we really need to think about food being beyond simply food. I think we've had a tendency to think about specific food projects, specific food programs, so an urban agriculture project, a markets project. But I think the danger in that is that we fail to recognize the way in which the food system is systemic and the way in which the food system intersects with these other urban issues. So for example, you know, it's one thing to have a markets project but you need to understand the role of the transport infrastructure in shaping accessibility of those markets. If we're thinking about improving food security, it's not simply enough to ensure that people have physical and economic access to food, but do they have adequate sanitation, adequate water, adequate sources of energy to, to cook that food? And so we need to think about the whole urban system and how to embed food thinking across that. So we're talking about moving from food specific to food sensitive programming. And this has always been a difficult thing to do. However, I think COVID-19 has in some ways provided us with, with a new set of opportunities. Because I think while urban governments have traditionally largely neglected food security and food systems, I think that the COVID crisis and food systems collapse that we've seen has made governments realize the centrality of food to urban life. And therefore I think perhaps um, this tragedy of COVID-19 might provide us with an opportunity for embedding food in, in urban planning, in urban policy making, in urban programming more, more directly. Uh, next slide, please, Ryan. The second one is around the need for greater civil society engagement in our food systems programming. Historically, we've seen that there's been limited civil society engagement around food issues. Um, there's been some interest in, in urban agriculture, there's been some interest in food redistribution, but there hasn't really been this large historic engagement. And what we've seen as a result of COVID is this kind of pop-up of people who are interested in food. So these are just a smattering that you can see on the screen of organizations that have a history or a recent presence in the food systems debates. And what we've seen is this emergence of crisis networks. People have realized the centrality of food and have mobilized around that. And I think if we're going to be honest, we need to acknowledge the limitations of local government. We need to acknowledge the limitations of the NGO sector, of all these, these groupings and recognize that we do need to pull in all of these actors who shape the food system and who shape the food system's um, outcomes. I think the particular challenge we have in the context of COVID is that a lot of these networks have emerged around the crisis. They've emerged around an emergency response to a systemic problem. So the challenge going forward is how do we maintain that energy and how do we shift this from a kind of crisis response to a systemic response. My final point, Ryan, I see I'm ahead of time, so this is great, thank you. Um, my final point is I think we're gonna see extreme austerity playing out. We're already seeing challenges with um, kind of disbursement of national government funds to local government in this crisis. We're seeing um, large scale and small scale NGOs having funding crises already. We're seeing private sector collapses. We're seeing perhaps even challenges with UN funding. And so there's gonna be this funding crisis across all of the actors in the food system. So the, the question is, how do we mobilize around that? What do we do? And I think one of the risks is that we're gonna see the large scale private actors increasingly trying to shape food policy. The large supermarkets, the large processes, large global food, food actors 
playing that role. And I think we need to be very cautious of that, particularly given the dual burden of malnutrition that we're seeing. But I think in some ways, austerity does also provide us with this opportunity to, to do things differently because we have to do things differently. And so there may be a collapse in project funding and it may force local governments to think more about processes around re redeveloping policy rather than doing projects. It might force more working together of different departments, moving from a, a single department working on food to a, to a range of departments. Um, and I think it's going to force government, civil society and the NGO sector to, to work together in more productive and creative ways to work with the limited resources we have. And so in the context of of the COVID crisis, we are in deep trouble. However, I think it is possible to use this crisis to reimagine urban food governance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jane, uh, for succinct and, and direct provocations. And I think um, while talking abstractly about food, we forget that we are in a horrible situation for many of our people. Um, and so uh, we have to hold that at the same time as charting um, our future uh, pathway. So uh, I would like to now um, go a bit deeper into uh, what some of our cities uh, have been doing. Uh, and would like to invite uh, Mayor uh, Ajisoa from the Accra Metropolitan Assembly to share um, some of the insights of how Accra is approaching food um, for its citizens uh, and what um, his city is doing to improve food security uh, into the future. Thank you very much for joining us, Mayor. Well, <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me say, um, uh, I, I really appreciate the opportunity given to me to share our experience in Accra and also to also learn from um, your wonderful panelists and their experiences that you've shared. Um, managing food systems within the city center, it's, the, uh, it's something that is often forgetful by, by city managers on the assumption that um, the food comes from the hinterlands livestock and, and fish all comes from the interland and we are the consumers. So, so long as the food is available, we'll consume. Without paying attention to the fact that um, wherever it's coming from, there are other uh, uh, systems that must also be considered. With that in mind, and having experienced this um, COVID uh, which is leading to some food shortages in some parts of the world and also likely to affect us in Accra. Um, we, we started off a couple of years ago by promoting um, home gardening. And basically, we realized that um, the, through education and training, the middle class are getting um, excited and the appetite is being wet for home gardening and, and hopefully go into um, large scale farming. And we've seen um, a lot of people moving from the financial sector, the private sector, and go into farming because they've seen the profit also, which is involved. But we, we, we're doing a massive education and training um, of people in Accra to appreciate the need for them to have home gardening within where they are. And in addition to that, we provide free seedlings also to them, and then provide also a ready market for their products. This has been very largely successful, uh, but it's just that um, we think that there are a lot more people that could also join on these home gardening uh, agenda that we had. Even ourselves on our on top of our efforts, we've also just started um, some gardening on top of our efforts. And we, uh, just a couple of days ago, we harvested some lettuce and some fruits, uh, vegetables, and how to take it home. So, and because it is fresh and it is out of your labor and your sweat, you could see. And, and when you are even consuming it at home, you're quite uh, very excited about it. This is also intended to, um, as it were, uh, provide some 
two things. One is to provide the fact that you have some food at home and also you have more fresh food that you also grow. So people are becoming excited also about that. The second aspect of promoting general agriculture within the, the city center is about livestock. Livestock is largely promoted among the low-income communities, the rearing of goat, fowl, and, uh, and, and cattle. It's quite common within the, the low-income communities uh, in Accra. And our veterinary offices support them also by making sure that the livestock are always in good health. They provide them with the food that they also need. And because we live in Accra, the, the, the foodstuffs that comes into Accra uh, becomes also um, um, a source of uh, food for, to feed the livestock also in Accra. Because there's a, we don't have a lot of green areas for them to, to, go and green, to go and graze. So they fall more on the, on the food that comes into Accra. So it becomes like a cycle. And livestock is a big business in Accra. We see a lot of young people that have gone into livestock, especially in the low-income communities. The big area is fishing. Accra lies along the Gulf of Guinea, which is close to the sea. Today, we are reconstructing the fishing harbor, um, which was relocated to Tema in 1965, and that had contributed heavily to the uh, to the low downturn of, um, of fishing in Accra. And because of the reconstruction of the fishing harbor, that is going to be a major boost to the fishing industry in Accra. And that is, a, it is, the, uh, is the pillar of the local economy. And it's going to turn around the entire economy once the fishing harbor is, is completed. But in between that, Fishing input are quite expensive, and they are not too common in our country, and sometimes it's difficult to understand. For instance, outboard motor to go for fishing is not commonly sold like you go to buy a car on the, uh, on the market and you can choose a variety of what you want. Most of these products are imported on demand, so it becomes a major challenge to the fisher folk to be able to assess some of the fishing inputs. So we've taken it upon ourselves to make sure that uh, we import those fishing inputs, especially their outboard motor, and heavily subsidize it as well. So the cost of it, um, um, it's like um, 18,000 Ghana cities. 18,000 Ghana cities is around, um, divided by six, that's around $3,000. Um, but the central government is taking um, um, uh, about half of it, so the fisher pool are paying thousand like thousand five hundred dollars, and it's also spread over a period of time so that uh, um, the fisher folk are able to get some of these fishing inputs to get it. So by and large, apart from the fact that we're encouraging people to get into it, we also step in by providing subsidies and guarantees for inputs for the fisher folks so that they will be able to do some of these things. One significant thing that we have done is to institutionalize an award scheme to celebrate our, our farmers, either those who are doing agri farming, livestock, or fishing. And, and every first Friday of December is even a national holiday where we celebrate farmers and giving give them awards um they've given up give them awards oftentimes um inputs uh and 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 some cash donations as well to support their businesses we do this to bring the nation's attention to the fact that agri is key and is the backbone to our economy and we celebrate the farmers the livestock farmers and the fisher folk on that day for their contribution to the city and their contribution also to the city. These and many other things that we are doing that is making us you know, very strategic. And finally, the, uh, the, uh, the, the buffer stock system arrangement that we have. Um, at the end of the day, 
um, whatever it's brought into this into the city center for instance like tomatoes oftentimes they go bad so the buffer stock that we have buys the excess uh, food on the market and we keep them and also release them into the system also occasionally and that also has, has stabilized the pricing of, um, of food that we have in Ghana. So largely, these are basic examples of things that we are doing in Accra, and we are quite hopeful that uh, as we scale up um, under the national program of planting for food and jobs, where uh, it is a national program and Accra is also part of it, and national government is providing all kinds of incentives for people that want to, to go into farming so that we can we can make Ghana um, self-reliant when it comes to food. And for the first time, Ghana is exporting some, um, some foodstuffs like grains to neighboring countries like Niger, Burkina Faso, and the rest. I think that we are doing so Thank well. You, Mayor, you're, gonna have to pause. you're gonna have to pause there. Thank you so much for, for your insights. And I think it's really impressive the different variety of tools you're using uh, to create an enabling environment for uh, farmers, fishers, and uh, market vendors as well. Uh, thanks very much for your insights. And uh, please, uh, uh, our attendees, please do share any questions uh, into the chat uh, for our mayor. We're uh, going to uh, cross the continent to East Africa and uh, share some insights um, from um, Nairobi. Um, our colleague, uh, Elizabeth Kimani Mouraje. Um, we're going to start with a video that was uh, Part of her contribution to um, the food system vision prize uh, and then she'll uh, speak for a few minutes uh, to that video. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Kimani Murage. I'm a senior research scientist at the African Population and Health Research Center. I'm also a public engagement fellow with the Wellcome Trust. I'm also a human rights defender and I'm particularly passionate about the right to food because I'm convinced that the right to food is the most basic of human rights upon which all other rights, including the right to life and the right to human dignity, are anchored. I have lived in Nairobi and worked in Nairobi for a very long time, for close to 20 years now. I have done a lot of research amongst the urban poor in Nairobi and have observed worrying trends of food insecurity and high levels of malnutrition amongst the urban poor. But this problem is not just a problem of the urban poor. I have also observed high levels of obesity and diet-related diseases across the socioeconomic dis divide. I cannot sit back and watch. Time for change is now. I want to lead this change in Nairobi. My vision is to end hunger and all forms of malnutrition in Nairobi by 2030. I also want to see Nairobi restored to a place of cool waters that is food secure, healthy and environmentally friendly by 2050. I want to see Nairobi as a place where people live in peace and harmony in the spirit of Ubuntu through a transformative, human-centered and regenerative food system. I want to call on all Nairobi residents to take responsibility for their diets by, by embracing local solutions to the problem of poor diets. I want to encourage Nairobi residents to, to embrace innovative organic urban farming and to ensure food, lo food loss reduction by sharing their excess foods with, with those who don't have enough to eat through a food rescue system. I also want to call on the government, both at the national and the county levels, to, to, to put in place supportive policy, for policy framework to support this vision. I also call on the civil society, including the media, to support this vision through social activism. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Liz to uh, unmute and uh, Ryan can move the slides uh, for you. Please proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I'm very glad to be in this um, webinar and I'm very glad to talk about Nairobi. And uh, our vision is restoring Nairobi to a place of cool waters 
through a regenerative, transformative, and human-centered food system. When you look at Nairobi, if you come to Nairobi at the face of it, you will find a very cool place, a beautiful place, the city in the sun. Uh, but when you go to the uh, next, uh, when you go to, when you when you go inside Nairobi, you will actually realize that Nairobi was not all that beautiful. Sixty percent of Nairobi residents actually live in informal settlements. You can see the kind of informal settlements that are there. They are heavily. Um, they are, they are, they, there is a lot of density in these settings. A lot of uh, environmental pollution air pollution and all that kind of thing. You can see uh, how food is being, uh, uh, food is, uh, a lot of food is uh, cooked on the streets and you can see the kind of environment that this food is being, being, being cooked. There is, a, uh, there is inequality in access to food and um, the, 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 the urban poor, who are, as I said, are like 60% are actually very, very food insecure, like studies we've done have indicated that about 80% of the urban poor are actually food insecure, and close to half of the children under five years are actually stunted. But there is a double burden of mal malnutrition in Nairobi across the, the socioeconomic divide. There is a very high level of uh, obesity uh, in, in, um, in the, in the non-poor areas. Uh, in Nairobi generally, let me say, about 48% uh, of women are actually um, uh, either overweight or obese. There is high, I mean, th th there are problems of food insecurity, I mean, food uh, safety issues. As you can see, this kind of environment uh, where the food is being prepared or um, where the food is sold, and also the issue of agricultural chemicals in the foods that we have in Nairobi. There is also a lot of food wastage because a lot of food expire like in the markets because uh, there, like for, for example, in um, urban poor settings, the, the food that in the markets, there, is, there, are, there are no ways of preserving that food. So after a few days, it gets wasted. So uh, those are the kind of challenges that we have in Nairobi. So this is our vision. So uh, we, 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 by 2050, we want to see a food secure, well-nourished and healthy population living in a clean and green environment where people live in harmony and peace. And the core strategies that we are thinking through this uh, food system, one, one, one critical um, strategy we, we are considering is innovative urban farming. We know that by, by 2050, it is expected that uh, Africa in general and Kenya will be more urban than rural. Uh, a lot of people will be living in urban areas. Like for example, Nairobi is expected, the, the population of Nairobi is expected to almost triple by, 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 by 2050. And so, so, we are, we, so the, the, the pro, there will be a problem of feeding the urban people, the people in the urban areas in Kenya. And that's why we think that uh, we cannot always just rely on food from rural areas. And the COVID-19 has shown us that we cannot just rely on food from rural areas. We also need to mobilize food production in locally so that people can have food to eat, especially if, uh, as I said, majority of people in Nairobi live are urban poor. But but also this urban farming will help to, to green the city and make, uh, and, and, uh, make the city uh, more environmentally friendly. The other, the other strategy we are thinking is the food, a food rescue system to rescue the food that is being wasted. A lot of food, uh, the whole of Nairobi is being wasted in many places. And if this food can be rescued, we can be able to feed many people who are, go who are sleeping hungry. Uh, the, the, there are other comp, uh, aspects that we are thinking about, complementary rural farming linkages, so that uh, to, to complement the food being produced in Nairobi, because uh, at the moment the problem is also the, the linkages are poor. So we want to strengthen that so that we can have enough food in Nairobi. And then we, we uh, agree business to ensure that uh, the people, especially those people in the urban poor settings, can access food because they have they can they have economic access. 
and we want to, to encourage a culture of sharing food, so through the food rescue system and uh, also sharing services across the socioeconomic divide. Next. Sorry. So um, this picture is a picture of um, the some of the of the people in the vision, the 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 the, the partners in the vision. So there is my team and some people from the community. This group is called Mwengenye. Uh, you can see they are doing some urban farming here in um, in uh, in where they live. I have also started my urban, urban, urban kitchen garden, and uh, I really want to be able to to lead the way. So this is me harvesting my vegetables, and I'm very happy that now I can eat very uh, safe, safe vegetables. These are organically grown, so I am not afraid that I'm eating uh, food with chemicals. And uh, um, so we are working. Sorry, Liz, we seem to have lost the connection. That the government has started an initiative called uh, One Million Kitchen Gardens that will, be, will actually be, um, be able to feed the city. So we are going to, I mean, the, gov the government is already in this, um, with this thinking that we can start urban farming in the city. In the cities, not just Nairobi, but other areas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz, for sharing uh, the process of the vision. And I think some really uh, great tools um, of connecting rural urban linkages, uh, agribusiness, food rescue, um, and innovative urban farming. Um, so uh, Liz uh, and, and her team uh, were one of 79 uh, finalists out of about 3,000 submissions to the vision, uh, and we will find out uh, in August. So uh, best of luck, and uh, we hope the vision can continue regardless of that process. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'd like to turn uh, to my colleague and friend, uh, Kodani uh, Mulatsi, who's going to share uh, insights on our food system from a just transitions perspective. Um, Kodani, please uh, turn on your video and uh, here we go. Uh, the floor is yours for uh, five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, so as many speakers have highlighted uh, before, um, our current food system is set up in a way that is, it provides the least to the people who depend on it the most. So the system is fractured. Uh, we've heard about how climate change is going to affect our food systems and how it's going to significantly impact the way we farm and the way we produce food and how we have access to food. Um, the COVID crisis has further highlighted those uh, cracks in the food system. Uh, we've seen um, during the lockdowns, people being unable to get access to food and all of that. Um, can I get the next slide? Next slide, thank you. So this is a picture that was taken um, in, this, uh, in South Africa, just outside of the city of Pretoria. Um, during the start of the lockdown. This is a queue uh, which formed up to four kilometers of people queuing for food aid uh, because the current system is so fragile that when people are within, without a, a, a salary for just a couple of days, it crumbles and they need food aid. So um, how do we go about then making changes to the food system to ensure that they, we provide sufficient, affordable and nutritious food for everyone, and what are those key priorities that needs to be addressed to ensure that um, equitable access to food for everyone, and not just food, but also nutrition. Next slide, please. So I will be speaking to a just transition. Um, we know that there's a transition underway because of climate change. Um, we also know that uh, COVID-19 is pushing us towards another transition because um, we've seen that the system currently as it is, is failing. But what would a just transition look like? So for a transition to be a just transition, it must be facilitated. If we see um, the transition will happen on its own. 
um, and then those who currently hold the power will still hold the powers and those who are fragile in the system will still be fragile in the system. So this transition must be one that is intentional and one that is facilitated. Um, it must address and not exacerbate the inequalities that exist in the current food system. Um, the transition must be just, which speaks to an item of justice. It must be equitable and most importantly, it must be inclusive. Um, in particularly in South Africa, this transition must also address the social inequalities that are, uh, occur within the agriculture system, but also within the retail system. The transition will require a significant uh, change in structure through the value chain. So how food gets from the farm to the fork, and it also requires significant change in policies because the current uh, food policies um, are not geared towards a just transition. Um, they, they, they don't speak to that. So if we're going to have an intentional facilitated transition, then we need to, government to also take the lead on that. Next slide. So if you can see this picture, this is currently the system that really gets food to the plate um, in most urban areas. But this is also a picture of a system, of an informal system that is not really recognized in the current food system. So if it's going to be a just transition, we need to understand the role of small scale farmers and fishers. We need to understand the role of informal traders, puzzle shops, and how food is distributed within the market and who has access to it and um, who can uh, provide food. Um, it needs to focus on uh, three aspects of the food system, which is the production level, the value chain level, and also food environments, uh, which speaks to nutrition. So it's not just about providing food, but it's about providing um, quality food and making sure that um, we address the issue of malnutrition all across our cities and the continent. So in terms of just transition, it's not about how we get uh, how what we achieve at the end, but also about how we get there. So um, what will the just transition in a food system look like? It will be about broadening access. So this looks at resources, commons, water and land. It's about democratizing decision making, so inclusivity. So you cannot decide design a system for people if they're not involved in the process and in the decision making. Diversity not only in terms of crops and food, but also in terms of people. Um, and it must also look at the science. So um, as we've had, climate change is going to change a lot um, of what we currently know. So um, science must be an important part of that, but also looking at indigenous knowledge that exists but has not been um, incorporated into the current system. It must recognize the power uh, by imbalances uh, that usually come with name and addresses. So the, the suburbs versus the squatter camp, it's um, Elizabeth has shown in her presentation. And it must also cater for resilience to shocks. And I won't even go too much into that because we've all seen it with um, the COVID-19 crisis. So what are the opportunities that COVID um, can present us? Um, it has disrupted and it has given us uh, a clean slate uh, if we take it to start over. So this can be an opportunity for us to transition the food system, not just to a new level, but to a level that includes um, everybody and caters for everybody. So some of the examples that we've seen um, from COVID is how it has highlighted the need for social protection nets, um, the need for resilient um, food systems that, um, equally provide for all, and the need for local economies. Um, so for what we've seen with COVID is that um, people recognize the need to access food from the smallholder um, farmers, and the, the farmers also recognize the need to sell to their local markets because they couldn't import and they couldn't export anymore. So that's one of the lessons that we can learn from this crisis. Um, the policy makers, however, must take um, this momentum and implement the learnings from COVID into policies. Um, it must not be just something that we speak about, but in five years time, we don't see 
what we've learned and how it fits back into our polities. So the uh, government must actually step up and maximize this process um, and also build synergies between food, climate change and COVID-19. Next slide. Um, so to wrap up, uh, this is a, a market um, in my hometown. Um, it started as an informal market of women who um, lived next to a farming area who started selling bananas along the road that leads to the main city. So everybody who goes to the main city passes by this market and will pick up fruits to take to the main city. Um, government has, uh, and the local municipality, has responded to this market by um, capacitating the women and providing them with infrastructure to make the market more accessible and to, but we, in doing that, they didn't take away the informality of the market, but they built resilience within the market by providing um, the women access to things like water and things like finances and things to um, a wider market of farmers outside of them bringing uh, the bananas from their own little farms and their, their own backyards. So this is one example of how we can start building just transitions in a, in a small way, but that can be impactful and also um, includes everyone in the system because women are the providers of food, but, but often when it comes to decision making, we don't get to see them. So in a just transition, um, we will need to have uh, these ladies from the market also participating in decision making. Thank you. Thank you, Kodani. Uh, I think there have been a number of really strong provocations in there. Um, and I, I particularly appreciate the, the principles of the just transition as connected to food, uh, broadening access, uh, inclusive decision making, uh, diversity, not just of food, but of people, um, using our different types of knowledges um, actively, uh, recognizing power imbalances, uh, connecting a bit with Jane's uh, worry about austerity and big food, um, and then being resilient to shock. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I'd like to widen our scope uh, again to uh, another uh, collegial network, the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact, and I'd like to invite uh, Vice Mayor Anas Gwudso to uh, share insights uh, about uh, policy and governance in our future food systems. Uh, welcome, Vice Mayor, and uh, look forward to your inputs. Good afternoon to everybody. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you also for inviting me also to this closing webinar uh, of the African City Food Month campaign. Also, we were together at the beginning of this adventure. I'm very happy to be with you also today. I am the Vice Mayor, as Paul said, of Milan, but I am in charge for food policy here in my city. But now I am here also because I am, uh, together with my, uh, my mayor, Beppe Sala, in charge also to promote the activity of the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact. Uh, my mayor is the chair as Milano began this activity in 2015 and we carried on a very important activity in all these years. I'm very happy also because uh, throughout this month, uh, many exchanges among, among cities, local authorities, experts and various organizations have taken place around urban food system and above all urban food system in Africa. And I think that I, I heard during one, uh, one webinar in the last days that Africa's future and its health rests in cities and how these are designed, planned and governed. And I think it's very important. I agree in a very deeply way because this is, there's a pressing need for improved food governance and nutrition security in African cities. And it's very important to understand Underline also the activity that in your cities uh, we can uh, underline. And today I'm happy to present to you the Milanova Food Policy Pact, focusing on its activity and opportunities in the African continent. Next slide, please. The pact, uh, you, you can see different also images of, of it. The pact is an international agreement among local authorities committed to work together to develop more sustainable, fair, climate-friendly, safe, and inclusive urban food systems. 
a lot of words you used also in your speech uh, before me. It's the only global joint declaration of mayors on urban food policies, and as such, five years later of its launch, it appears to be an ideal framework to stimulate exchanges between cities and local, national, and international actors in a very pragmatic way, so we can exchange ideas, projects, strategy, and also everyday life. Next slide, thank you. The Milan Pact is an expanding community. You can see all over the world a lot of cities belonging to this network. Over 210 signatory cities all around the world. It has a governing body, we call it the steering committee, composed by 13 cities with a two-year mandate, and the secretary hosted here uh, by the city of Milan. And Africa cities, you can see uh, in the next slide, uh, are very, very active within the framework of the Milan Pact. Up to date, 35 cities have signed the Milan Pact, and among them I can mention Abidjan, Batam, and, and Nairobi, that are part of uh, the steering committee. Three uh, regional meetings have been held since 2015 in Africa. I was in Dakar in 2016 for the first regional forum of African cities. Then the forum took place in Brazzaville and Niamey. And I'm very happy to be here together with representatives of the municipality of Niamey and, and, uh, uh, and, uh, um, uh, and Nairobi. Uh, many African cities contributed with sharing the best practices on food policies. And in fact, African cities have proved to find specific solutions tailored to their own regional features and challenges. Uh, the pact, uh, the network is composed by a lot of different cities, but I think that each mayor must focus his policies uh, in his own challenges, tailoring the policy for his city. And however, the data presented during this month show that African cities, especially the big ones, but every city, face huge challenges, appearing to be less resilient to shocks and have fewer resources. And so we have to stress the importance of the alliance to work together to face these huge challenges. There is a lot to work on, and I salute this campaign as a useful tool to exchange and learn. And next slide, uh, please. And I want to spend some, wor some words also to present uh, our uh, most powerful tool together with your campaign, the Milan Pact Award. The purpose of the award is to recognize innovation and stimulate good practices exchange among signatory cities toward more sustainable food systems. We get, by gathering year by year, uh, cities' experiences from all over the world, we built a rich common platform of food policy knowledge. The previous edition of the Milan Pact Awards collected 261 food practices assessed by an international evaluation committee. And I think we can consider um, all these practices like a sort of library or living experience that should inspire and promote the dissemination of innovative solutions. Uh, in this challenging time, we have launched a special edition of the award called the Milan Pack Talks. The COVID-19 emergency has shown that cities are on the front line and we uh, spend more than one word on, on this uh, issue to provide concrete solutions to citizens' needs. And in particular, mayors through their food policy teams had to face many unexpected urgent challenges as the urban food systems have been severely hit by this external shock. The call for their participation to the Milan Pact talks asks signatory cities to submit up to three short videos in relation to their COVID-19 food system response. The aim of this Milan Pact Talks 2020 is to share knowledge about the measures undertaken to answer, adapt, and mitigate food system shocks. I think that it's very important to uh, share uh, projects, ideas, but also 
uh, very good policies because good ideas can be shared. You will find all the relevant information you can need to participate the link shown on the slide and also on the Milan Fed website and social media. And uh, collaborating among uh, uh, cities is crucial. The role of Africa is very, very important and the role of American cities is very important uh, for all of us for all the network, and it's very important to have different voices from different continents. I invite you to send your contribution uh, by the 5th of September 2020, and I'm very happy to see that uh, African cities have uh, po policies very interesting also for cities far from Africa, and it's very important this exchange between different cities. I would like to thank Play Africa, RUAF, the FIO, and all supporting partners for organizing this successful campaign, all cities and participants for the available contribution. And I look forward to continuing this discussion with you looking for future food visions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vice Mayor, for the insights and for sharing the, the breadth of the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact. Um, we certainly look forward to strengthening our partnership as we move forward with our food work. Um, so thank, thanks you for your, thank you for your words. Um, we have one final uh, presentation uh, from our colleague who's been behind the scenes moving uh, slides and supporting uh, technically with our webinars. Um, so Ryan is going to share uh, some insights on uh, food, uh, nature, climate equity, and local governments. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Paul. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning to, to everyone joining from across the world. Um, really encouraging first and foremost to see how our objectives at ICLE um, with regards to um, working with cities in, in the space of sustainability is aligned with, with those of our partners um, and, and peers alike. And I think it's really been emphasized over the course of the month of Africa City Food Month and indeed today. Um, through the great uh, presentations and, and, and interventions that we've had so far. And really, I think, you know, for us as ICLE, and, and I think as, as the month has really showcased um, the importance and the, and the, the importance of food, um, in, in, and I think in life in general, and really how, at least pre-COVID, our food system has had such a detrimental um, impact on the environment. And I think... Um, at least the, 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 the pre or the, the, the post-COVID era provides us with, with numerous opportunities to, to change that narrative really um, towards sort of how we, how we plan and, and how we develop going forward. And really food, as I mentioned, being the basis of, of, of life um, and really linked and, and looking at through the lens of nature, climate and equity. And I think there's, there's massive opportunities there um, and really today's um, webinar on the back of a successful month is really to reflect on the month, but really looking forward to what our food systems look like um, going forward. And I think it's important to make the link and the connection with food and nature um, and just emphasizing the strong linkages between the two. And I think, you know, the, the one can't do without the other. And there's already a lot happening um, in terms of, of, of driving nature. We see that um, on a daily basis through our engagement with cities, um, engaging on, on our cities with nature platform and, and, and really being active in the space of, of driving nature in cities. And there's real opportunities there to regenerate nature, um, particularly looking at, at indigenous vegetation, for example, and the links and the opportunities that that pose as a primary food source. Um, we look, for example, to a country like Ethiopia, where they're embarking on a massive tree planting initiative. And it's really, we need to look at at, at it beyond just tree planting and looking at um, how we can actually um, focus strongly, more strongly on, on, on indigenous vegetation. And, and the beauty of indigenous vegetation is, is the reduced or the limited impact that it does have on the environment because of its natural um, existence in specific ecosystems. So that should really be um, a strong focus for, for our cities and, and I think society in general to look at um, planting of, in, of indigenous vegetation um, and as obviously from a food source perspective. And I think another important point is obviously the, the connection um, between people and nature. 
um, we've had some interesting insights, for example, from Nairobi in terms of how, what the, the benefits are of, of urban agriculture and food gardens. And I think just open spaces in general and how important that is for, for life, um, for food and, and that, that connection with nature. And I think more importantly also, we need to be um, diverse in our food choices and, and really look to stimulate um, balanced diets to not just be um, dependent on a specific food source. I think we all know, for example, how the impacts of, of livestock farming, farming, for example, um, the impacts that that has um, on our climate going forward. So we really need to look at, at broadening our scope in terms of, of what we eat and how particularly around the production of food, how we can mitigate those impacts um, on our climate. And I think obviously more importantly, and, and, and it's really been emphasized this past week um, in our previous webinars around um, the importance of, of, of breaking down these injustices and, and really um, pushing for equality and equity um, across the board. And really, you know, our children being our, our future, we, we really need to look at um, on preventing of stunting and, and, and those, those obesity um, figures, for example, that's what, that was presented um, within Nairobi, for example, I think that's not, that's not unique to Nairobi. I think, you know, we, it's a problem that we're facing in Africa um, more broadly. So we really need to, to emphasize the importance of creating education and awareness um, and really pushing for nutritious and healthy foods um, for inclusion in our diets. And then I think, you know, breaking down the silos, for example, and, and the, the stigmas around, around things like breastfeeding um, and really fo pushing the, the, the local foods agenda um, because there's massive benefits there. Um, and then improving economic participation. I think um, malnutrition is, is, is a massive um, challenge, not just in Africa, I think the worldwide. And there's opportunities there for empowering youth and women um, within the, the, the sort of scope of, of agribusiness. So as ICLE is in the business of, of working with, with subnational and, and, and cities, um, I, think, I think this slide has really been, been highlighted um, throughout the month and, and of course today. And if you just look at the state of our, of our cities, particularly in Africa and the, the informality um, thereof, I think there's massive opportunities there for, for, for cities and, and networks like ICLE and our partners. Um, to strengthen, for example, um, those urban and rural linkages, um, to ensure food security. There's, there's, there's opportunities there. And I think this has been a hot topic, I think, throughout um, this COVID period specifically with regards to um, food security and how um, those, those um, linkages um, should be strengthened to ensure food security going forward. I think, you know, also there's a massive reliance on retail for for not just food, for, but for livelihoods in general. And we've just heard what opportunities um, the sort of informal markets and sector um, has for cities um, to sort of break down those, those, um, those uh, challenges. So I think there's massive opportunities there um, just using that informality of our cities um, and using the opportunity to, uh, for post-COVID era to develop and be more sustainable. Um, and really, I think local governments, you know, has the opportunity and, the, and, and is well positioned to be the catalyst for positive change. And I think our mayor, our good friend, Maya Araujo of Kilimanjaro in Mozambique has, has um, highlighted this, this stance um, very well in the previous webinar around governments being, um, local governments that is being primarily positioned um, close to citizens. You know, we mentioned um, proximity and legitimacy of these institutions to really try, drive um, and push positive change um, within our food systems. And really we know that our, 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 our cities and our local governments are at the forefront um, of understanding and responding to the needs of citizens. Um, and I think um, what this month has also highlighted is the need for multi-level governments and go governance and, and partnerships and, and stakeholders. And I think we as equally always emphasize that our cities cannot um, do it alone. Um, and I think what this month has also emphasized and, and shown is the wealth of knowledge and, and, and information and resources and the world to partner with, with our cities um, from the wider stakeholder groups. And we have one, I think, one minute to close. Thanks, but I think just to, just, to, just to conclude, and this has been information that we shared throughout the month, and this is basically just to show you know, what cities can really do to drive that, that change. Um, and it's really to facilitate 
um, as I mentioned, that, that wider stakeholder participation within the, the broader sense of, of food systems um, demonstrate how um, organizations and citizens can improve. And I think really cities um, is at the forefront of showing and demonstrating how, that, how they as institutions um, can affect that change and really um, leading by example. Um, and I think, for example, uh, I think a practical um, solution would be to procure healthy and sustainable foods um, that actually enters the city spaces, um, investing particularly in youth and women. And I think, again, the webinar on Wednesday um, has shown innovative ways of how, how women and youth are, are actually being um, and driving the food system. And I think Arusha, for example, in Tanzania, um, is an amazing example of how they're actually driving uh, that uh, innovation around uh, youth, women, and pe people with disabilities within the food system. And I think lastly, um, it's just to develop the, the need for, for integrated food system policy um, and really for local governments to create that, that enabling environment. So I think with that, um, I'll close and say thank you very much. Thanks so much, Ryan, uh, for the insights. And uh, I think we've had a really great learning journey together, uh, engaging with uh, Arusha and San Narivo uh, and many of our cities in the city to city food exchanges. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to lead into discussion. Um, I, I always feel like we should uh, attempt to, to try and do some live engagement, but otherwise I'll turn to some of the questions that have come in. But if you'd like to raise your hand in the Zoom uh, function and address a question to any of our pan panelists, that would be great. Um, I'll uh, offer 10 seconds or so for someone to join. Otherwise, please do uh, voice any questions into the Q&A box or straight into the chat, and we can address these. Muzi, I see your hand, um, and I'm allowing you to talk now. Uh, please do keep your questions concise. Um, we want uh, some good engagement across all of our panelists. Um, Muzi, please unmute yourself. Yes, uh, th th thank you, Paul, and uh, just to say thank you for, for, for this uh, very in impressive month and uh, the collaboration with FAO is really impressive. Maybe what I, what I would kindly like to raise, the, probably it's a, it's a comment more, more, more than a question, because we, we see that in the African cities, there, there is a lot of these informal food traders. They are just found all over the corners of the streets, probably it's uh, sometimes in not so good structures, and uh, you, you can just tell that there's so much high level of uh, post-service food loss there, you know, because sometimes they just don't find, find the buyers. Sometimes you just see these nice fruits and vegetables they are going to, to waste. Uh, what can be done really to integrate them into the mainstream uh, uh, markets and making sure that probably they, they, they sell their products to the high income consumers who, who rather prefer buying in supermarkets rather than buying from, from these street food vendors. I think it's a, it's a very big problem. And with this COVID outbreak, uh, we, uh, it's obvious that I think a lot of them has been, have been affected. And it, it's sad to realize that a lot of the street food vendors are mothers who are very critical in, in nutrition. So I think that is my comment. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Muzi. Um, I'm going to direct uh, your, your comment and uh, question to, um, to Liz. Uh, she can reflect from a Nairobi perspective. Um, Liz, uh, you can turn on your video as well, and we can have our, our panel visual. OK, I'm not able to. Yeah. I'm not able to start the video. Okay, no, it's good. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. Um, so I think that the, the food vendors, the, the smallholder food vendors need capacity building. At the moment, the problem is that we do not have enough support for them. So um, a lot of food goes to waste. We need to help them to be able to preserve their food for example, there are, there are some, some local methods of preservation of food that can be used, and they are not being used because they, they, uh, they don't have the capacity to do that. So that is the kind of engagement that we need to do with the government, the local government, so that the, the local government can support these people to be able to preserve their food locally 
so that it can keep for some time and then also uh, empower them to be able to 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 be able to sell this food to the to the middle income places so it's the capacity that is lacking for these people to be able to to do to go beyond just selling their food within their local uh, community to sell to the other people because they don't have that capacity so i think it's a matter of building the capacity and engaging the government to support them thank you i think uh, jane would like to add to that point yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I think one of the, the issues we need to understand is historical food governance, right? And so historically, African governments have really given the sole responsibility to to public health. And so we've, we've framed the informal trader as a, as a problem, as a liability, maybe as something that gives livelihood, but not something that is essential to the food system. Um, and so there's a need to understand that perspective and recognize that there is this long-standing anti-informality within our cities, We're, you know, most governments are wanting to move towards formalization. So I think that there's a need for information to go to governments to help them understand the centrality of these traders to food security and to the food system. Um, and to think about how one creates an enabling environment. So what kind of infrastructure needs to be put in because it cannot simply be on the, the trader themselves to create this, the phytosanitary situation. There needs to be this acknowledgement that, that these are a central part of the food system and therefore that food policy needs to move beyond kind of some of the standard things and to thinking about how you create that enabling environment for those. And it's gonna require a mind shift in local government. Thanks so much uh, for your thoughts there. Um, Sylvie uh, Watts, um, please unmute and share your question. And please direct it to, to someone. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I, I really enjoyed so much this uh, webinar. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm Sylvie Wabs. I'm agronomist and I'm working on the agriculture and food system in FAO on its resilience program, especially post-COVID and resilience program. And we're looking very much at the rural urban linkages and looking at um, the, the transition and the opportunities that the COVID-19 is is giving is a terrible crisis but it's, it's giving as it was mentioned by some of you an opportunity to transform um, the, the food system and it's very very much needed for saving this only planet that we have and and the better well-being of the people i think overall in in all of the the talks the the role of trees um trees in terms of, of fruit trees um, shading trees, uh, fuel trees, uh, protection trees, it's for, the, for livestock. The role of trees should also be um, added in, in this very complete perspective that you have mentioned. And, and Lewis really um, did very well on, on, on you know, the local, the nutritious, the safe, the resilient, the climate friendly, all, all these elements are there. And I think, and I heard fisheries and livestock and backyard garden, very good, but the trees is very important. And then perhaps to also complement- so Please, yeah. uh, can you, can you uh, address your comment or question to someone? So, so if any of the panelists can um, enrich the presentation with some of the example of how trees is coming into this food system and some decisions and governance policies are including measures and the role of trees. Thank you. So is there a panelist who'd like to reflect on uh, the connection of uh, urban greening and trees uh, with food? Perhaps Ryan or Lewis? I am happy to talk about that. Um, okay. So in our vision, actually trees are, fruit trees are very uh, important part of our vision. We are actually working with the uh, World Agroforestry as well, a partner in this vision, and we are going to do a lot of greening with trees, fruit trees, but for food, for food, for beauty, for environmental friendliness, to ensure that we are actually saving our climate, uh, we, are, we, are, we are abating the climate change. So that is really an important part and uh, maybe it's the, short, the shortness of the time that we had for presentation but that is a very important part of it because um, trees are very important for the environment and uh, 
environment is part of this uh, whole sustainable food system that you are talking about. Thank you. If I, if I can and, add and that, just, uh, just please uh, I think uh, uh, the, the element of trees, the silver part of things is very important. And um, talking about the urban setting, I think the linkage between the rural and the, and the urban, in the rural setting, agroforestry is very key in terms of uh, sustaining the systems, the, in terms of producing uh, the diversity of the dyes that we need, fruit trees and all the other trees that are in the system are critical and we just need to make sure we take them along with the rest of the components that are, that are required to make the system sustainable. And they are the most sustainable, they, they probably they provide the most in terms of resilience uh, to, to most of the climate variables that we see. Thank you. To, to add a point, we had hoped um, the mayor of Marrakesh would join us uh, for our closing webinar uh, because we've been quite impressed by the uh, approach to um, plant lots of productive fruit trees um, throughout the city uh, as one of those approaches. Um, but I think we have a critique on the notion of uh, food in the city um, from um, Renaud. Uh, urban farming is largely insufficient to feed our growing cities. So how does this link with wider agricultural policies and innovation uh, and the traditional actors in this sector? Um, and I'd like to connect that as well to another question about um, staples versus uh, our focus on fruit and vegetables uh, and the importance of, of uh, that. Um, Lewis, you, you had the floor, otherwise um, I might ask uh, Jane or Kodani to reflect on that. Lewis, would you like to take that on? Sorry, I thought you said, uh, Jane. I think, I think uh, the, 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 um, the focus on staples and, and or, or for staples or uh, fruits and vegetables. I think the, what we are talking about is a diet that is uh, nutritious and adequate, and we need both. But I think what we, are, what we are saying is in terms of the area of production, you will not be able to, they are not nutrient dense, the, the cereals are not nutrient dense. They are produced much in much more bigger areas. So we are looking at those being produced probably in the, in the, in the rural peri-urban. But when you are looking at the fruits and veggies, we are talking about nutrient dense foods and you can produce in the small spaces what we have in the urban settings. So it's, we have to see this integration and take it as an integration of the linkages between the urban and the rural and make sure that we craft policies and technical options that make that en encourage the the cross uh, linkages between the urban and the and the rural you it will be difficult to produce most of the cereals in an urban setting because the the what you need there is not uh, the, in terms of area is not enough but for all most of the fruit and veggies is possible because they are nutrient dense that that would be my my response to that yeah thanks Lewis. um i'd like to invite another question from abdullahi um, I've enabled you to talk. Abdullahi Usman, you raised your hand. Would you like to address a question to one of our panelists? Well, we... Okay, presenters. Uh, Hello, good uh, afternoon. Hello, good, good afternoon. afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. How are you? We're well. Will you, will you please address a, a question to our panelists? Yeah, thank you. I would like to extend my appreciation to all presenters for their wonderful presentation. And uh, we are looking forward to see uh, more of this kind of webinar in order to improve and widen our knowledge concerning local uh, agricultural uh, food system. Uh, actually, uh, I would like to have an advice from you on how we can at least uh, help our rural farmers <coughs> to boost their production because most of these farmers are cultivating uh, between one to two hectares of land with outdated and traditional technology. So I would like to have at least a kind of uh, advice from you on how they will go about their in the increase of their production. Thank you. 
Thanks, Abdullahi. Thank you. Is there a, Lewis? Uh, please, please quickly. Uh, thank, thank you very much. I think uh, this is uh, an area that FAO is very much concerned about, the productivity and the production in the rural settings. It's, it's, it's a question of having the right plants, the right crops, the right soil management, the right water management. And this will vary from context to context. But what we are looking for is not only the right, but the right in terms of climate change. We need those technologies and practices that are going to be able to make the farmers produce, but in a sustainable way. It's, it's not about really uh, old fashioned ways of doing things. Some of the old fashioned ways of doing things are actually the relevant ones for, what we, for the situation where we are now. What we should be looking for is producing in harmony with the soil, with the land, with the trees, produce all the food that we produce in harmony with, the, with, with nature as it were. And this is where we really need to identify the right technology for the different contexts and make sure we are producing uh, uh, with healthy soils. That is the starting point. Okay. Have the soils as healthy as possible, provide the nutrients for the soils. And it, it requires a lot of training, capacity building on how the farmers can do it right. There are so many different technologies. I cannot uh, talk about that. I can spend the whole day talking about what they can try and do, but it depends in the context where they are and what kind of uh, environment they are working in. But we just need to make sure we are producing in harmony with this nature. Let's get our soils right. Let's get our water use right. Let's get our everything that comes with it right. And make it a food system. Look at beyond just for the production. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Lewis. Uh, I'd like to direct a question uh, to the Vice Mayor uh, before we turn to Kodani and Jane. Um, I see you had something else to add. So, uh, Shall, shall I let you speak and then I can direct the question? Just a few words, not to reply, but to suggest it, to find some uh, ideas among all the practices that we uh, I mentioned before. On the website of the Milan Tech World of Milan Urban Food Policy Pack, you can find a lot of uh, practical activities uh, that presented, that some keepers from Africa presented at the above all last year. And it's very interesting to find, for instance, a lot of cities working on urban agriculture, for instance, Arusha, Praiva, Antananarivo, and a lot of, the, uh, of projects that they uh, submitted for the Milan Pact World. I don't want to underline to give a lot of details, but if you are interested in seeing all these projects, you can find them on the library. Thanks, thanks so much. And I think we'll, we'll share a link um, to the library uh, with the recordings when we send these out. Um, there was a question from Kibrom Tesfe um, reflecting on some of the strong work by the mayor of Addis um, in Ethiopia. Um, they've included a student feeding program, uh, providing land for urban agriculture, incentives for urban farmers, fertilizers and technical support. Uh, and he reflects that the most important is if this mayor is encouraged, it will have an impact on other cities in the country. Um, so his question is, is how can uh, Milan Urban Food Policy Pact help uh, with this? Um, but perhaps just a further reflection on um, the role Milan Urban Policy Pact uh, plays in sharing these uh, practices. Vice Mayor, are you, are you with us? I don't understand exactly, sorry. Sorry, so, so the reflection was on these really good practices um, by the mayor in Addis um, and reflects the most important is if this mayor is encouraged um, and uh, having an impact on other cities. So I think here is a reflection on the importance of peer-to-peer -peer learning. And you would just like to know what uh, you can help with this with uh, Milan. Well, I think that our role is to underline the importance of the alliance between cities and in this approach that must be practical and not just uh, in some way philosophical. And it's very important to underline that relationship between mayors, and this is the reason why I stressed uh, the fact that this network is made up, uh, is uh, not just composed by, it's very important, and I'm here together with you because I, I mentioned the activity of international government network as very important, but we need also cities in their practical activities. And so the importance of, of the role of the cities must be underlined together with them. 
not from an outsider point of view in which some other can suggest to cities and stop, but we need an exchange between cities, international government alliance, and also everyday life. I think that's our rule as mayor, vice mayor, and person in charge in making decisions and in making policy is to have the chance to share uh, with other people in the same situation in order to be able to traduce and to translate into action what we share, uh, speaking about goals, issue, and, and uh, ideas. It's very important to, uh, in some way, find a way because we have to realize how we can share goals, we can share tools, we can share instruments, but we have to share how to use this instrument and these tools. And I think that uh, in campaign like this uh, that uh, it lay promotes, it's the, sh the chance to stay together in the same platform. Okay, thanks so much. Um, two final questions, which are uh, probably quite big to answer quickly, but I'd like to uh, share one that's just been put in the chat. Um, whose food system are we imagining? Um, and I'd like to direct this to, to Kodani. Um, from Gary Kasem, he has a disquiet about some of the positions that we've offered here. Um, appreciating the contextual conditions in the alternative food systems critique, there's a question if this reflects middle-class acts. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll pause there, but just uh, if you can reflect on that and your provocation of the just transition, not just being an end goal, but a process. How do we get there? Um, and so Gareth's fear is that we're not being presented um, that what is being presented remains at project level, but not a systemic perspective. Um, so if you can reflect on that. Um, interesting question and a very relevant one. Um, so within the transition, we're looking at um, exactly that. Who is this food system for? And if you look at the current food system, you'll realize that it's not built for everyone. So, um, in our current conversations, and not only in conversation, but in actions and in policy, we should be moving towards a system that is for everyone. And that doesn't start at the end, as Paul has said, it starts with the process. So we need to start including everyone in this as part of decision making and as part of um, policy making. So um, people in the informal settlements, the, the, the poor in the urban areas, and even in the rural areas who uh, sometimes provide us in the cities with our food while they barely have enough um, in the areas where the, the food is farmed. So it's about taking all of that in and hopefully um, the COVID crisis has really shown us not, it, it's not new things that we didn't know, but it has sort of thrown it in our face and hopefully we carry those conversations forward and we carry those lessons forward when we design policies and especially um, for government. But as civil society, it's our role in a way to keep reminding government not to forget those lessons that this year has taught us. Thanks. Thanks so much. And, and staying with what COVID is showing us, um, we have two provocations for Jane. Um, with regards to the comment about taking the momentum of community uh, networks forward um, and perhaps some reflection on how we do that in a sustainable manner and keep the energy um, while um, uh, ensuring that their resources are directed appropriately. Um, and then a question about the role of big foods uh, situating themselves as saviors uh, and how we navigate that. You're on, you're on mute there. Yeah. I was trying to breathe. It's always nice to get the easy questions. Um, you know, I think, I think I'll come to the big food question first, um, because I think there we are in this, this moment where certainly in the South African context, we've seen the big food players, the, 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 the supermarkets kind of positioning themselves as, as those who are able to distribute vouchers, as those who are able to guarantee the supply chain, as those who are able to guarantee safe and accessible food. And I think we need to recognize that that happens in this local context, but it's also been happening in the global context with, with the, the, the way in which the kind of public private partnerships have been played through, which have given increasing voice to those players. Um, and my concern is that we can't talk about empowering the small scale without moderating the power 
of the big players. And they have a role in the system. Everyone has a role in the system. The food system includes all of us. But we have to figure out how to increase the agency of, of the eater and the agency of all the people along the food supply chain. And so I, th I think, you know, I'm not saying we need to get rid of the big players, but we need to think about how we're going to moderate their power in, in these systems. Um, I've entirely forgotten what the second question was, Paul. It was about the, 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 the ongoing community. The momentum of the community network. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that, I think that's really exciting. I, you know, we are seeing this moment of, of increased awareness of food issues, of, of the kind of re-emergence of street committees, of the, the, the importance of, of community kitchens, of networks across different parts of our cities all pulling together. Um, but we are already seeing that system becoming fatigued as more and more people go into crisis. And we're already seeing fractures and fissures along those systems because everyone has a different perspective on how to bring these things together. So I think probably what is required are new forms of inclusionary, governory, gov inclusionary governance processes. So not, not the old kind of food policy council, but, but, but some kind of long-term commitment of a group of people to maintain that conversation and not shutting it down into a particular program, but creating that space for dialogue. And we're seeing those things popping up in different ways. But I think it is create, it's maintaining dialogue and recognizing that we will always have different perspectives. We will always have different entry points, but we need to find some common ground and some common agenda. Um, and good luck to us all. Good luck, good luck indeed. Um, thanks so much uh, for our panelists. As always, um, we have too limited time to properly uh, dialogue and debate. So. Uh, I hope that that's something we can work on for future um, events. Um, we're going to close, and I, I do beg our participants' indulgence for an extra three minutes to our uh, time schedule. Um, but I would just like to share some of the upcoming events, um, as well as ask for your insight. So I know a lot of uh, people have dropped off, uh, given that we usually do an hour and a half as opposed to two hours. But uh, this means you have stronger voting power uh, here now. Um, so we're going to share a poll. Um, Brian, you can leave the, the screen up and uh, ask for your insights um, on what our next uh, African City Food Month um, should focus on. So what types of activities um, would you like to see? Um, Oh, I realize it's only in French. Uh, so what types of activities would you like to see in future campaigns? Um, this is social media posting, um, sharing resources, recording video resources, live uh, webinars as we've done, um, online interactive sessions, short courses, and physical events in cities. So we have two votes. Um, there we go. Okay, we'll give you another 20 seconds. Okay, uh, and we can end, end this poll, please, Ryan. Um, we won't share as we've run out of uh, time. Um, and if we can launch poll two, and if Ryan, you can allow our panelists to vote as well, given we excluded them last time. What themes would you be most interested in seeing in future conversations? Business innovation and technology, financing mechanisms, food security and nutrition, food policy and governance, inclusivity, uh, youth, women, people with disabilities in our food system, indigenous foods, nature and climate, you can scroll down, resilient food systems, sustainable food value chains, and other. I'll give another 20 seconds. Thank mm -hmm. you.
And if you don't see your preferred themes or activities, you can throw them into the chat for us. Okay, 10, 10 more seconds for the last itchy fingers. Um, and then Ryan, uh, if you can end the poll and um, share our screen again. So we have a lot coming up. At the moment, the Cape Town Food Dialogues are in full uh, flight. Um, there's some really interesting resources. So I do encourage you uh, to go to capetown.food.dialogues.info. Um, these are being hosted um, by the South African Food and Urban Food and Farming Trust um, with really great insights. Uh, so please do join there. On our next slide, the African City Food Month has been part of Rise Africa. I'm going to go through these slides super quickly to respect our closing time, but we really invite you to join us for our next webinars, which will be on SDG localization. Um, and there's a whole program of events uh, as part of bringing together thinkers, doers, and enablers to think about the future of African cities. Um, I'm going to share links in our follow-up. Uh, we can skip the next slides, which are on our SDG webinars. And one more. We invite you to have a look at our Instagram photo competition, which in June focused on food. Um, and we now have a June winner um, who reflected on the price hikes of onions uh, in informal markets. Um, and the next slide shows our runner up who reflected on um, food vendors um, making use of the mobility transfer stations. And our next runner up who was reflecting on um, the community action networks providing food uh, directly to people. Um, so do have a look at uh, our Instagram page uh, and share your pictures of water in August. Finally, um, almost finally, I'd like to welcome uh, Patrice Seller um, from the FAO subregion for Southern Africa and our uh, partner in this campaign to offer, offer some closing uh, reflections um, in the next uh, four minutes. Um, Thanks, Patrice. We can hear you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues, uh, once again. And it was uh, really interesting to hear all the speeches and the presentations. And I uh, could really see that we really had a fantastic uh, month, uh, African uh, City Month campaign. And so, dear colleagues and friends, it's really uh, for me an honor to be, to be offered this great opportunity to close the African City Food Month campaign and to reflect on today's great input. So for a long time, uh, governments and international institutions have considered food security and safety to be depending only on food production. But today it is really obvious that there is a more complex understanding of the food issues turns to the food system concepts. However, in this new understanding, the building of more resilient food systems has been still focusing mostly on food production. So part of the food system that seems still far remote from the urban areas and they are consumers. In short, cities and their consumers in the past were not particularly included into the solution finding. But yet the COVID-19 crisis has shown us that cities have huge role to play in developing resilient food systems. Urban dwellers and their mayors had to quickly focus on having food prices stay affordable, wet markets operational, and new food delivery systems and logistic functional. All these measures did not directly move, involve uh, rural areas and, produ and producers. So the debate on food is no longer the subject 
of only the experts in agronomy, nutrition, and macroeconomics. The COVID-19 crisis has accelerated the fact that food has become the matter of all citizens, all consumers, and inevitably cities themselves. Also, several African cities, including the big cities and the small ones, have proved through local food governance mechanisms the agility of local actors to innovate and find together solutions while facing the unprecedented situation by actively participating in shaping the future of more resilient food systems. The COVID-19 might make it its mark on history and be a cornerstone for the way in which we consider and manage economy, trade, natural resources management, and climate change by putting human beings at the center and not outside of the ecosystem. We may have faced a lot of challenges, including economic ones, and the life may be tougher for some years now, the years ahead. But as uh, Churchill rightly said, never let a good crisis go to waste. So this is also an opportunity to rethink our food systems in a sustainable and resilient manner that we should not lose. In this context, Africans should turn their head to wrong direction looking for solutions and models in Africa. Our culture, the food culture, is more resilient and diverse and tasty than anything that came or can come to us from outside of the continent. If you have ever tested raw chicken a la Zambesiana with mukapata from Mozambique, the Akabanga extra chili oil from Tanzania, the Nigerian fit suya, the zebu, the beef from Madagascar, the banku from Ghana, galulu from Angola, or seafood galore from Tanzania, and also the ndole from Cameroon, my own country. You know what I'm talking about, how all these food are very tasty. But somehow in many countries, we don't really invest enough to take one step ahead and add value to these great products that come from our farmers and from our lands. We need to change this pattern. We need to change the narrative of being importing nations on food importing continent. We need to invest more as local councils and national governments and consumers into our local food systems. If we look around, and as we heard during this great campaign, we have the best and most passionate youth and women agripreneur who want and who know how to make this change. As we, as FAO Southern Africa, are developing a sub-regional program focusing on the main issues our urban consumers and urban food system face. So this includes the food safety issues, aflatoxins and excess of harmful pesticides in our food, but also special planning and production of infrastructure policy, the risking of urban and peri-urban agri-value chains and investing, as the most important, investing in full market hubs. We are currently assessing the main investment opportunities to address these issues together with ECLE, and we are looking for more partners, city practitioners, city leaders, local private sector and donors to join us in this exciting work. If we all aim to one direction, we can make the change possible. So let me finish by conveying our appreciation to our great partner, ICLE Africa, for this successful and excellent campaign. African City Food Month was truly inspiring and necessary. My thanks to Paul Curry, Solofina Nekesa, and Ryan Fisher. You have been excellent. I would also like to say thank you to our FAO Urban Food Agenda team under the leadership of Jamie Morinson. My thanks also to my colleagues, Barbara, Mercy, Lewis, and Sina for leading this important work in the sub-region. I will stop here really by, by thanking all the participants, all those who were really involved 
during the whole month of July in the African uh, city food, also to tell all the mayors who were really uh, available and who took time to attend all the webinars and also the webinar today. So this, this really show your commitment and the hard work you are doing on a daily basis to provide safe food to, our, to the citizens in, in your cities. And we like really to count on you and you are our partners uh, in, this, in this process. So I also like to thank all the te technical, all, all of you professionals who also work hard in good collaboration to make this month a succeed. I would say that this is the beginning of a long process and FAO stand ready to work with you in this journey. Thank you again and congratulations to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrice, and thank you for the support that you and your team have offered. Um, I would like to hand over to uh, Kobe, our regional director, for a word of thanks, uh, and then we'll close the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. And I think, Patrice, you said it all. Um, I also want to congratulate my team in Italy, Africa, Ryan Fisher, Solofino Nikesa, Paul Curry, Tia Buckle, Sonia Smith, and the many other people in our Ikki Africa office that have been working very hard to make this month a success. And also turning to our partners, turning to every one of you, you. Um, Rua specifically, uh, we've come a long way. Um, this is a very good manifestation of what we can do when we stand together. And then a deep uh, and very sincere thank you, Patrice, and to everybody from FAO. Um, it is wonderful working with you um, this year. Um, we've, we've started this uh, process some two, three years ago with a first city food um, uh, congregation. And um, look where it's led us. This is the first, but certainly not the last, African City Food Month, and what a start it has been. Thank you to all the fantastic experts, Jane, so many of you, our honourable mayors, the representatives of mayors, the technical people from cities. Um, I don't want to repeat anything Patrice already said so very eloquently, but I completely agree with, with all the sentiments shared. Um, what The one thing I would like to say that stands out to me is firstly, the fact that how interlinked food is inherently to our human beings, um, to humanity on earth. And humanity on earth is very, again, yet again, very intrinsically linked to planet earth and to our planetary boundaries and to nature. So health, food, nature, nutrition, um, ecosystems, climate change, all those things need to be addressed together. And COVID-19, yes, it is an opportunity to reset the button, to rethink what our, what our relationship towards food and in a bigger scheme towards nature is. So thank you for making those links. Thank you for the in-depth discussion, discussions today. It was a very compelling webinar. And with that, I just want to say, with a team like this and the participants that we've seen over the last months, there is certainly hope in Africa. We don't want to see those long queues of people standing waiting for food packages. We want to see people who are well nourished and can sustain themselves and can have healthy diets and good nutrition. And that is what we're working for in our cities and in our urban rural connects. So thank you very much and congratulations. What a fantastic team we make. Thank you.